The Sony a7S III is my new favorite video camera of all time. This video is sponsored by Vidivo.net. If you're looking for stock video footage, graphics, music, or sound effects, head over to Vidivo.net right now. Check out their 100% free catalog. If you like the free content that you see, you may wanna upgrade to the $15 a month plan. This gets you 25 premium video downloads per month. Or if you upgrade to the $25 per month plan, you can get 50 premium video or audio downloads per month. But again, you don't have to spend anything at all if you don't want to. Head over to Vidivo.net right now. Check out their royalty-free, 100% free content that you can start putting in your videos right now. For the past three years, we have been filming almost all of our videos on the Panasonic GH5 and GH5S. I think we own six GH5s and two GH5Ss. We're going to be comparing the Sony a7S III to this camera a lot simply because this is the camera that I am used to. Now, this isn't a very fair comparison. I think you can buy this camera right now for $1,400, whereas the Sony a7S III is $3,500. But this is the camera that I'm accustomed to, and there's a few features in this camera that I absolutely love and I never want to have to give up. And I would have had to give up if I wanted to shoot exclusively with the Sony a7 III. I bought this camera a year or so ago. I think some of the features on this thing are great, but there's just a few really strange decisions Sony made with this camera that drive me crazy, and therefore I almost never use it, but they have fixed every single one of them with the Sony a7S III. Let's talk about some of them. Let's first talk about ergonomics. I think the Sony a7 III and previous Sony cameras are some of the most uncomfortable cameras on the market to hold. I feel like the body just isn't tall enough. My finger falls off the bottom down here and then the grip is so shallow. Instead of gripping it with my hand, I'm gripping it with my fingers. And I am thrilled that Sony decided to make the grip on the Sony a7S III just a little bit bigger. It holds the exact same battery as the a7 III, but finally when I pick this camera up, it doesn't feel like I'm using my fingertips, I'm using my whole hand and I actually enjoy using it now. Now, one feature of Sony cameras that I have absolutely despised for years has been the menu system. I feel like I've been using the a7 III for a long time now. I still can't find anything in the menu. When I have to do something, I find myself Googling it on my phone. Like, how do I turn off autofocus? How do I switch into manual focus? It is so much better on the Sony a7S III. I would even say, I think that I prefer the menu system on the Sony a7S III to the Panasonic GH5, and that's saying a lot. One of my absolute favorite features of the Panasonic GH5, and something that I want on every camera, video or still from now on, is one of these flippy screens. I don't know the technical term here, but one of these screens that articulates out and will spin 360 degrees. This allows you to do a few things. First of all, when I'm filming, I just constantly leave it out like this. I usually hold the camera a little bit lower. I can stabilize the camera with my elbows up against my uh, stomach and side like this. I find it much easier. If I need to shoot something up high, I can flip this down and hold it up over my head very easily. Or I can flip it around like this and record myself. And that's what I'm currently doing on the Sony a7S III right now. And the other great thing is you can flip it like this and close it. And then when you put it in your bag, you're not gonna scratch your screen up because it's protected. Older Sony cameras had a flip screen that just kind of flips up or down, which is nice, but again, it's nothing compared to the full flippy screen of the Panasonic GH5. And I am thrilled to say the Sony a7S III finally has this screen. It can articulate in the exact same way, but the screen itself is much better. It's much brighter. There's much more contrast. The colors on it are much more vibrant. It's just a pleasure to use this screen. The digital viewfinder in the a7S III is also fantastic. By far the best digital viewfinder I have ever seen in my entire life. Too bad I don't think I will ever use it. I'm just going to use the uh, screen on the back. Now, if you didn't already know, the Panasonic GH5 has a mirrorless four thirds size sensor and the Sony cameras that I'm talking about today have full frame sensors that are significantly larger. Now for that reason, you would expect the small lenses that are on the micro four thirds camera would be significantly cheaper. But if you buy third party lenses that are abundant for Sony mirrorless cameras and non-existent for micro four thirds cameras, you can actually get cheaper full frame lenses than micro four thirds lenses. Check this out. 
The lenses that I shoot with on the Panasonic every single day are the 12 to 35 millimeter 2.8, that's a 24 70 millimeter equivalent, and the 35 to 100 millimeter 2.8, which is a 70 to 200 millimeter equivalent. And although they are great lenses, incredibly sharp, great stabilization, incredibly small, really a pleasure to use, they do seem kind of expensive for how small they are. On the A7S III, I've been testing three different Tamron lenses. I've got the Tamron 28 to 75 2.8, which is just $879. That's crazy when you compare it to Sony's 24 to 70 millimeter for $2,200. Now for that price, you would expect the lens to have stabilization with the Sony, but it doesn't. So it's literally more than double the price. I've also got a 70 to 180 millimeter 2.8 Tamron. That's $1,200. Now compare that to Sony's 70 to 200 for $2,600. At least this lens does come with optical stabilization. For wide angle lenses, I have the Tamron 17 to 28 for $900 and compare that again with Sony's 16 to 35 for $2,200. Now, if you wanna buy all Sony lenses, absolutely, it's going to cost you way more than if you stuck with a micro four third system. However, if you're willing to buy third party, and I think the Tamron lenses have been great so far, you can save a ton even over these much smaller lenses. Let's go a little bit deeper into stabilization. One of the best features of the Panasonic GH5 is its stabilization. It has in-body, it has optical with the right lenses, and then it has digital stabilization as well. And you can get incredibly stationary looking footage if you aren't moving. If you're walking around, you're definitely gonna wanna gimbal, but if you're just standing and you wanna get handheld shots that look like they were on a tripod or maybe just a little bit of movement, this camera is amazing. It's the best I've ever tested by far. All right, I'm currently walking with the Sony 28 millimeters stabilization off. Here's standard. And here is active. We're now recording on the Panasonic GH5. There's no way the autofocus is going to be working here. It's horrible. However, I bet the stabilization is going to look better. So not only are we testing autofocus, we are also testing the stabilization. Now, I don't think this camera is gonna look very good without a gimbal. Now, I expected the GH5 to destroy the a7S III when it came to stabilization, but I was really impressed with the Sony again, especially when you consider that I was using a stabilized lens on the GH5 and I didn't have one for the Sony. Now for the next test, this isn't even going to be fair. Let's pit the Panasonic GH5's continuous autofocus to the Sony A7S III's autofocus. Now, even in the unlikely event that the Panasonic does find my face, every three seconds it pulses, it'll lose my face and focus on the background. Sometimes it'll just focus on the background. Sometimes it won't focus on anything at all. I don't know what this camera is thinking. And I had high hopes for Panasonic. They've been releasing cameras over the last few years that are much newer than the Panasonic GH5. And I keep hoping, okay, they gotta catch up with the competition with Sony and Nikon and Canon. Eventually they're gonna release a camera that has working autofocus, right? And they never do. They release cameras that have slightly better autofocus, but nothing compares to the Sony a7S III. Maybe you guys watching this video are not impressed by this, but this blows my mind. I have been filming for days with the Sony a7S III. I don't know that it's ever missed focus once. This entire video that I've been filming right now is in continuous autofocus. I can see myself on the screen here. It's locked onto my eye. It never lets go. If I move this way, it, it attaches to this eye. If I move this way, it attaches to this eye. Instantly, I am blown away by Sony's autofocus. I mean, this is beyond what human focus pullers are able to do at this point. We did test after test in bright light and dark light, walking forward and backward, turning my head, walking away from the camera so it can't even see a human face, and it captured everything perfectly. I am actually more confident leaving this camera in continuous autofocus with face detect on than I am putting it over into manual focus, manually focusing it and just leaving it locked off. That is how I have filmed videos for the last three years with the Panasonic GH5. But if your subject moves out of that focus plane, it, they're going to be blurry. But I am just 100% confident that the Sony a7S III will never miss 
focus. I never in a million years dreamed that a camera could be this perfect. And when you go from using a camera where the autofocus is 100% worthless to a camera like this, where I feel like I have a personal focus puller who is flawless at their job, who's ready to work for me whenever I need them to, it's, it's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about slow motion. This camera is capable of shooting 4K 120 frames per second, and it looks fantastic. Check out this footage that I got at a local duck pond here. Believe it or not, I shot all of this footage handheld, 180 millimeters, with autofocus turned on. My wife was throwing bread in the pond, and this bird was just picking fish out of the pond. The footage looks insane, and I literally could not have gotten this with the GH5 because it would have been so difficult to keep this bird in focus. This bird looks crazy, and somehow the camera seemed to know where the eye of this bird was and keep this bird in focus for almost the majority of this video. There was a few times when the bird would turn away from me, and so it would focus on the back of the bird, which makes sense. That's what any camera would do. But the second the bird's head came around, it seemed to lock right on it. And I don't think I would have been able to get this footage at all with the GH5 because I would have constantly been pressing the autofocus button to try to lock onto that bird. But the bird was constantly moving around and I just don't think I would have been fast enough to keep up with it. Certainly the camera's autofocus wouldn't have been fast enough to keep up with it. So I was super impressed with how the footage looked in slow-mo and how the autofocus worked while shooting in 120 frames per second. Now let's say you wanna speed footage up. There's two different ways to shoot time lapses. The professional way is to shoot a million raw files and then put together some video time lapse on the computer. I don't have time to do that. I want my cameras to build time lapses in the camera. And this is something that the Panasonic GH5 does really well. You can actually take still images and then in the camera itself, build a video file after you're done taking those images. So if you wanna be able to edit those raw files into a time lapse, once you get back on the computer, you have that option. Or if you think it looks good enough in camera, just build the video file right there, transfer only the video file to the computer, delete all those raw files. And that's exactly what we do when we're traveling with Alaya around the world, shooting time lapses all day, every single day. There's no way in hell I'm transferring all those raw files over. I want it all done in the camera. The Sony cannot do that. However, what the Sony can do is flip into S and Q mode, which is slow or quick mode, and you can shoot up to one frame per second time lapses. And basically what it does is it records video, but only captures one frame per second. And then when you're done, it plays it back at 24p or whatever you have your timeline set to. You can do the opposite in S and Q mode and set it to 120 frames per second. And then when you play it back, it will automatically play back in 24 frames per second. It'll play back slow-mo on the back of the screen. But the problem with that is it doesn't have audio in S and Q mode. So for me personally, when I'm shooting slow motion, I just set the camera to 120 frames per second. That's very easy to slow down on the computer. But if I'm shooting time lapses, that's when I set it to S and Q, set it to one frame per second, I'm good to go. All right, let's talk a little bit about ISO performance. This was supposed to be the low light king. Many people still call it the low light king simply because the Sony A7S II was the low light king. But in my tests, it's good. It's just not really any better than other cameras that I've tested. So if you compare it side by side with the Panasonic GH5, yes, it's absolutely better than the super small sensor on the Panasonic GH5. But keep in mind, Panasonic sells the GH5S, which has fewer megapixels and better ISO performance. And that's getting kind of close to the Sony A7S III. The really interesting thing was when I compared the Sony A7S III to the Sony a7 III. I expected the Sony a7S III to be way better, at least one stop, but probably two or three stops better. And I just didn't think it was. I mean, if you look at this footage side by side, I might even say that the Sony a7 III looks better in terms of ISO performance. The grain is much smaller because the pixels are smaller. There's double the pixels in the a7 III than the a7S III. I expected those big photo sites on the Sony a7S III to uh, be a lot more light sensitive. It's good, maybe it's even great. It's just not that much better than other cameras that are currently out on the market. So I don't know, don't buy it for ISO performance only. Now the Sony a7S III also has a ton of different picture profiles as well, including S log three. This is the really flat profile that allows you to shoot more dynamic range 
and then come back in post and edit that footage and retain more detail in the shadows and the highlights. Now, I've been slow to jump on the log bandwagon just because it adds one more step in post. It's also really annoying to try to look at your footage on the back of the screen when it's all washed out. You never know if you're getting a correct exposure. The Sony a7S III has this feature called Gamma Display Assist. I've mapped it to one of the buttons and I can press it and it adds a look or a LUT to that really washed out log footage and it makes it look normal. It makes it much easier to get a correct exposure and it makes shooting in log much easier. When you get back to the computer, adding the contrast and saturation is actually incredibly easy and so I may start shooting in log now. The a7S III has dual card slots, but each slot can accept SD cards or the new CF Express Type A cards, which are almost identical in size, but much faster. They also come with a ridiculous price tag. I bought the most expensive and largest card currently on the market. I think I spent $350, something like that on this card. It's just 160 gigabytes. I purchased this card because I wanted to see how quick it was at transferring footage from the camera to a computer directly from the camera's USB-C port. Now this USB-C port has been upgraded from previous cameras. You can now actually power the camera forever with a standard USB-C cable. It has to be one of the high powered ones plugged into a high power jack, but you don't have to worry about dummy batteries or anything anymore. You literally just plug the camera in and it keeps going. So I was excited about this jack and I wanted to see the transfer speeds of this jack. Now this new CF Express Type A card is supposed to transfer at 800 megabytes per second. But sadly, when I plug it in with the USB-C cable, I was maxing out at 352 megabytes per second. So for this reason, I think I'm going to return this card. I think I'm going to stick with V90 SD cards. One other change from the a7 III to the a7S III is that finally this camera has a full-size HDMI jack. For the average person, maybe that's not a big deal. But for me personally, I always find myself wanting to plug in HDMI. And even though somewhere around this office I have a converter, I can never find it. And it's just another reason why I never use the Sony a7 III. And one more reason why I love using the Sony a7S III. One other thing that I've always loved about shooting on the Panasonic GH5 has been its battery life. And in the past, Sony cameras have been horrific when it comes to battery life. I'm talking about filming like 30 to 45 minutes and the battery is dead. I thought for sure the GH5 would still be better than the Sony a7S, especially with the brighter screen and just so much more processing power. But I heard that the battery life was better. So I put them side by side and I just let them run. The GH5 died after about an hour and a half. The a7S III warned me at about an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes in that, hey, there's no battery life left. And I thought, oh, okay, it's almost identical to the GH5. It went for another 35 to 40 minutes. It ended up filming on one battery, two hours and five minutes. I am shocked. I never thought it would be able to do that. And that's one more check mark for the Sony. It actually has better battery life than the awesome battery life of the GH5. In conclusion, what are my thoughts about the Sony a7S III? It's amazing. I absolutely love this camera. But at the same time, when I compare it side by side with the Sony a7 III, in many ways, it's very similar. And it makes me think, maybe I don't need a $3,500 video camera with just 12 megapixels. Maybe I want a Sony a7 IV that has the exact same body as the Sony a7S III, but it has double the megapixels. I thought that the point of the 12 megapixel sensor in the Sony a7S III was that we were giving up megapixels to gain ISO performance. I just haven't really seen that to be the case. So I would prefer to have more megapixels, and then I could truly use this camera as the ultimate hybrid shooter. I could shoot stills with it 100% of the time or video with it 100% of the time. But being that this camera only has 12 megapixels, it makes me think that I'm going to use it almost exclusively for video. But if I was ever going out to take a photograph or I got hired for some job, I would still probably reach for my Nikon D850 simply because it has more resolution. The Sony a7S III has made me think that I really should love my Sony a7 III more than I do. But there's just a few things that drive me crazy about it, the ergonomics, the menu system, the lack of full-size HDMI, the fact that I can't even see myself on the screen. But Sony has fixed almost every complaint I had about previous Sony cameras with the a7S III. And for that reason, I love this camera. And it has me thinking every day about potentially selling all eight of our Panasonic cameras 
and switching over to Sony completely.